Hey, this is Sam. Welcome to BNS About Movies. Uh, we're going to go through this another marathon episode, the second of three June exploitation episodes. Let's get into it. The uh, June tenth was Shark Exploitation, which is one of my favorite genre. Uh, and of all those movies that came out in the wake of Jaws, probably my favorite is Tintuera Tiger Shark. It's based on the book by oceanographer Ramon Bravo, but that's not all Ramon did. He discovered the sleeping sharks of Iowa Morehays, of course. But he's also the underwater zombie in Lucio Fulci's Zombie. He also wrote the book and the movie Tintuera Tiger Shark, which is as much a shark film as it's a softcore movie concerning the three way relationship uh, between its heroes. Uh, and also that the guys probably love each other more than the girl who's in between them. But that's me putting subtext into it. It's also the only shark movie I've seen with full frontal male nudity, unless someone would like to correct me. Uh, made 13 years after Tintuera is Furia Asina, uh, which w- came out in 1990, and that's the movie that I pick. It's about ecological-minded scientists devoted to solving the riddle of AIDS by studying sharks and taking their antibodies. As you can imagine, that makes the sharks more murderous, if possible. The film follows one of them, and uh, the shark keeps beeping repeatedly every time the camera gets close to it as the Jaws theme plays. I don't even think Joe D'Amato or Bruno Matai had the balls big enough, cojones maybe, let's speak Spanish, uh, to do that. But uh, if you're thinking, huh, this is like Deep Blue Sea, well, yes. As that little cool Jay said, there's also a BDSM loving serial killer in the loose who takes one of the scientists and ties her up, puts her in danger. There's also a Casio demo track that is the soundtrack. There's also lots of spandex, lots of butt shots. Shot on video, released straight to home video. Also, Gerardo Zepeda, who plays Periente, and this had quite the career. Appearing in everything from El Topo to Sorceress, Dr. Tar's Horror Dungeon, Caveman. He's also the monster in Night of the Bloody Apes and the Cyclops in one of my favorite Santo movies, Santo and the Blue Demon vs. the Monsters. Now, this is not as good as Tintuera, but the fact that it exists and I found it means a lot to me. The next movie, which was Italian Horror, uh, I've always worry am i going to run out of italian horror and i haven't uh is uh guilt yunkabe de dario argento from 1987 uh, dario argento's nightmares a tv series created and directed by argento it was part of the rai tv show giallo by enzo tortora tortora is probably most famous for the show portobello a show that had viewers call in and buy or sell things present ideas or try and look for love if they could get the parrot who is the show's namesake to say his name portobello they would win a prize Tortor was arrested in 1983 and jailed for seven months as through a case of mistaken identity. They thought he was part of an organized crime family. He uh, got out of 10 years in jail. Thanks to the radical party who offered him candidacy to the European parliament, which we, he won in a landslide. He was cleared of all charges the year the show ran uh, and brought it to uh, RAI as long with, along with a new season of Portobello on this show, he discussed unsolved murder cases while Argento, created nine new mini movies they're three minute shorts they're shot on 35 millimeter and look awesome they have some incredible effects one of them uh, upset viewers so much it's rarely been shown since so the stories are the window on the court argento's tribute to alfred hitchcock and rear window after watching a f- rear window a man named massimo watches his neighbors fight he runs down with a knife to stop them but falls on his own weapon and is blamed by the police for killing the woman uh, if you recognize the music, there's a lot of pop music in this, but uh, it's the Simon Boswell score for Phenomena. Night Rituals is the next, and this is also missing from some online versions of the film. It has a maid conspire with a voodoo coven to murder and devour the couple that she works for. The Worm is next, and that's probably the best one I'd say of these. It's a woman named Bettina is reading Dylan Dog. That's the comic that Cemetery Man comes from. When she overhears a story about parasites that move from cats to humans, just as she's petting her cat. As she uh, starts exploring her nearly nude body in a mirror, she notices a worm has grown out of her eye, so she stabs it out. Loving and Dying is set to Michael Jackson's bad, uh, and the story has Gloria assaulted and left for dead. As she recovers, she believes the man who attacked her her is one of her three neighbors. She sleeps with each in an attempt to learn who it is. The most notorious segment was Nostalgia Punk. It says a woman's water be poisoned. She begins to vomit multicolored liquids and then parts of her body before she finally tears her insides apart and uh, her organs rain out of the destroyed carcass. It got so many complaints that Argento was told to tone it down. 
with Strega, which is the witch, has party guests playing a game called The Witch with the children that ends up with them screaming and holding the bloody head of the guest of honor. Uh, it uses Marconi's score from Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Falling asleep uses Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols and is a man possessed by a demon just before he falls asleep and then he decides to eat his dog. This is Italy. Sammy is the next one. This is really simple. It's a young girl who is frightened when Santa enters her room. Uh, Santa then removes his face and he reveals that he is like a worm looking monster. Finally, the last one is the nightmare of the one who wished to explain Dario Argento's nightmare. It's a kid. It's meta. A kid comes to the studio to be in it. Argento is way too big of a star to even talk to the kid. They put him in a hotel with a bunch of foreigners and they steal everything he has and then threaten to kill him. That's all set up by Argento to actually create the segment for the show. Also, at the beginning of every episode, Argento appears, often with Corlina Cataldi Tassoni, who was in El Bosco, uh, Opera, and Demons 2. Uh, she's all goth out, and she's kind of like his uh, starry-eyed assistant. He also created uh, another segment for Jalo, uh, Night Shift, which was about cab drivers at night. Uh, episodes were directed by Lombardo Baba and Luigi Cosi. Uh, Argento also shows in these episodes how he filmed some of the biggest moments in his most famous movies. And I'd say that's the best reason to watch this. You get to see how the Luma camera sequence was done in Tenabre, the bird attack in opera, the transformation scenes in demons too. And the greatest part is literally him sitting with goblin and explaining Suspiria and showing them how the music should feel. Uh, these also appear in Luigi Cosi's Dario Argento master of horror. It's, you know, if you don't have any interest in Dario Argento, you might not enjoy this, but for devotees of Italian horror and especially hardcore Argento fans, this is required viewing. You get nine new stories, uh, even though they're short and it's on YouTube. I'll put the link in the uh, show notes. Bobby's lucky. He'll be okay. Some kids aren't as lucky. I shouldn't have left him with just a housekeeper. I'm talking about the men who push poison onto young kids. Something's got to be done to stop it. Every day a new drug comes along, and these creeps push it onto kids. There's millions of dollars worth of drugs being processed in this building. Much of it highly explosive chemicals. We can destroy it in less than a minute. And I know the people who can help us. This is our target. Maria gets the guard's attention here. April and Keiko cut through the wire and get to the roof of this building. Michelle, Terry, and myself bust through the main gate. Next day of June exploitation was New World, and uh, I picked Angel's Brigade from 1979. It's directed by Graydon Clark, and yes, this movie is pretty much a ripoff of Charlie's Angels, but is that a bad thing? Uh, there's seven girls in the seven angels. There are policewoman Elaine Brenner, who's Robin Greer from Satan's Cheerleaders, high school teacher April Thomas, Jacqueline Cole, who is Graydon Clark's wife, martial artist Kako Amaro, who's Leo Chin. Stuntwoman Terry Grant, who's Sylvia Anderson from Dawn Portrait of a Teenage Runaway. Model Maria, who is Noella Velasco. Vegas singer Michelle Wilson, who's Susan Kiger, who is in a ton of stuff like Seven, Death Screams, Galaxy, and uh, Hots. And two years before this movie came out, she was the January 1977 Playboy Playmate of the Month. And Trish, who is Liz Greer, Robin's sister. And they go up against drug dealers that have put Michelle's baby brother Bobby in the hospital. This movie... Even though you would think it's a Charlie's Angels juggle movie, never really feels seedy. All the ladies have their own jobs. They're independent uh, and they're all gorgeous. Yeah, but they're also super intelligent and way cooler than anybody else in the movie. They have awesome costumes and uh, 
they even have like uh cartoon transitions between scenes like wonder woman and have an awesome 70s van uh the bad guys include future andy sedaris leading man darby hinton jack palance and peter lawford how about that for star power if there's even more jim backus plays a right-wing militia leader who they steal weapons from alan hale jr is michelle's manager so we have some gilligan's islands folks in here Perhaps the wildest casting is Arthur Godfrey as himself. At one point, Godfrey was heard on radio and seen on television six days a week with nine different CBS shows. Yet the end of his popularity came when he publicly fired singer Julius La Rosa on his radio show before going on a spree and firing more than 20 employees in the next few years. And the public began to see through his image. But here he is in a low-budget Graydon Clark movie, and Pat Bratram's in it too. Best of all, the Angels get a Charlie and it's Neville Brand. Did I cast this movie? Because it's seriously everybody I love. It looks way better than it should because it's an early Dean Cundy shot effort. And as for that van, well, Darby Hinton bought it when they were done with the movie and put a hot tub in it. One assumes that his mustache got one heck of a workout. Clark would later work with Palance on one of my favorite movies he would ever make without warning. This is also one of four movies Jack made with his son Cody. The others, in case you ever need this, are God's Gun, Young Guns, and Treasure Island. A lot of reviews get upset that this is so cartoony and PG rated. Then again, they make fun of the acting too. If they've never watched an exploitation movie before, uh, it's also called Angel's Revenge and Seven from Heaven, which is a way better title. Meet Felicity. She's the world's cheekiest, spunkiest, sexiest new girl, and she's got a story to tell you. with Felicity as she takes you to Hong Kong and a very different world of sights that a tourist never sees. What is this place? Don't be afraid. We're going to take a bath. Like you never had before. Felicity and her beautiful Asian friend will take you into a world of oriental bathhouses and softly scented delights and in among the junk people, the bars and the sometimes seamier side of life in their quest for pleasure. Felicity finds love in the strangest places and always plenty of volunteers to teach her more. I want us to make love together. She realizes from the beginning that there's more to love than meets the eye. And you'll realize there's more to Felicity than meets the eye too. What are you wearing under that dress? Just suspenders and panties. Take them off. It's not actually what she does that's very different, but it's just where she does it that's eye-popping. Aren't you gay? You mean here? Why not let Felicity do it for you? All right, the next day's pick is Ozploitation. And I picked Felicity from 1977. John DeLamond worked in promotion before directing his first two movies, Australia After Dark and the ABCs of Love and Sex. These Mondo films were both successes, which led him to making his first narrative film, which is Felicity. He also wrote Sky Pirates and directed Nightmares. Obviously, this movie is beyond indebted to Just Jack and Emmanuel to the point that it gets referenced multiple times. There's even a similar wicker chair scene. Uh, Lamont said, the French have always been able to make their films not be pornographic. They'd be erotic. They were classy. The most, you could say, they were softcore. And the way they did it, they made pretty images that looked like a Singapore Airlines TV commercial. They had nice fashion, good photography, nice music. And the way it dresses it up and makes it all chocolate boxy. I guess that's an Australian term. I thought, okay, the way they do that on a film budget is to go somewhere exotic. Make sure the people are pretty, don't have pimples, don't be sordid. Have pretty music, exotic locations, nice lighting, and nice fashion. So even though it was a tiny film, we came up to Hong Kong and we got all the clothes tailor made for them, so they fitted properly. Anyway, Felicity Robinson is played by Gloria Annan, who was in Prey and the Lonely Lady, two of my favorites. She spent most of her life in boarding school, forever dreaming of the kind of true love and maybe lust that she's read about. Well, she mostly reads Emmanuel and the Story of O, and if you look closely at the uh, copy of the Story of O she's reading, it's a book tie-in and Udo Kier and Clarine Clary are on the cover. She also maybe kind of fools around with her fellow classmate Jenny, 
And uh, that means more to Jenny than Felicity. Felicity's father arranges a trip to Hong Kong to visit his friends Christine, who's Marilyn Rogers from Patrick, and Stephen. As soon as she gets there, Felicity sneaks and watches the two make love. Christine realizes this and decides to introduce Felicity to the adult world, first having her be deflowered by the much older Andrew, and then meeting the exotic Mei Ling, who is Joni Flynn, who uh, was a model. She's in Monty Python and the Holy Grail and Octopussy. Uh, Mei Ling takes her on a exotic, erotic journey through the East, as happens in these movies, but uh, Felicity remains traditional and eventually falls in love with a nice boy named Miles, who's Chris Milne from Thirst, another great Australian film. There's even a scene where everyone goes to see the ABC of Love and Sex, which Lamont said was total Roger Corman. He also intended to make a sequel, Felicity in the Garden of Pleasures, that the Australian government was going to invest in. Controversy resulted. That movie was never made. Felicity's voice is the director's wife, Diane. That's also the reason why this movie feels charming instead of sleazy. Uh, there's a lot of female perspective in it. They pull another Emmanuel move by claiming that the story was written by the lead character, Felicity Robinson. Sadly, uh, actress Gloria Annan went some dark times in her life. She dated racehorse owner Ivan Allen for more than a decade, and when their relationship ended, both she and her mother were evicted from their home. This led to a major British court case which established the parties and ancillary relief court proceedings may generally expect the information they have provided about their finances to remain confidential and protected from publication. When she died in 2017, several documents she was writing regarding her relationship had been released and being used to create an expose of Allen, the British legal system, and the criminal elements in the world of horse racing. The last movie she was in was Le Mans True Flies. I had so much fun watching this movie. Certainly, if you watch Cinemax After Dark, you probably saw movies like 11 Days, 11 Nights, Emmanuel in Bangkok, Gwendolyn, Secrets of Love, Three Rakish Tales, Young Lady Shatterly 2. The fact that I can roll these without looking them up, maybe says, you know, I was a complete nerd when I was 13. These movies seem so naughty then. Uh, while Joe D'Amato's Emmanuel movies are still horrifying uh, in a great way. And watching this today, I feel the same way that people that once got arrested for watching nudie cuties and uh, nudist films must have felt when hardcore started playing legally. This movie doesn't really feel that dirty at all. People would talk about these Cinemax movies as if they were so scandalous, but they're not. Anyways, June 14th is a beach movie, and I went with Linda from 1973. Uh, John D. McDonald had a lot of his books turned into movies. The Executioners was filmed twice as Cape Fear. Soft Touch became Man Trap. Also, the novels Darker Than Amber, The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Everything, Condominium, and A Flash of Green were all made into movies. Even this one was made into two TV movies. The second stars Virginia Madison as Linda. Linda is played by Stella Stevens, and she's in a bad marriage with Paul, who's Ed Nelson. He's daydreaming of leaving her, where she suddenly picks up a gun and shoots their friend Anne and turns the gun on Anne's husband, Jeff, who is John Saxon. And yes, that's the reason I watched this. Paul calls the cops, and when they arrive, Jeff is alive, and uh, the two some accuse Paul of killing Anne. As you can probably figure, Linda and Jeff are working together to get rid of their spouses and make a new life for themselves. Luckily, Marshall Journeyman, who is John McIntyre, who replaced both Ward Bond on Wagon Train and Charles Bickford on The Virginian when both those actors died, uh, shows up. He's an elder lawyer. He takes the case and starts to investigate Linda and Jeff. Paul also breaks out of a cell and learns that his wife has been conspiring, which leads his lawyer to get the cops in on a scam to call her and try and get a confession. She's too tough, but uh, John Saxon's character folds right away. She tells him to be spineless and tells her now ex-husband, She's not going to be in jail for long. Originally broadcast as an ABC Saturday suspense movie on November 3rd, 1973. This is directed by Jack Smite, who made my wife Becca's favorite movie, No Way to Treat a Lady, as well as some other great ones. Uh, Airport 75, Illustrated Man, The Traveling Executioner, Number One with a Bullet, and Damnation Alley. Maybe those last two don't fit uh, into good movies. Stella Stevens is wonderful in this. She's super cold, has everything figured out. But as she met, she's never been able to find a man who can be as strong as her. Her current husband can't even bury a dead animal without having a nervous breakdown. Her lover gets her arrested for murder. I'd love a sequel where she takes over the entire prison. On uh, the 15th is a free space. And oh boy, I picked a movie I've been waiting to watch for some time. Run! Run! 
As the spider said to the fly, you don't really think you'll get out alive, do you? I want this man. Believe in him. Tell him you love him and we'll see him. I love you. You love me. Oh, my God. I'll contact you. Please don't hurt her. Don't worry, Mom. Daddy! No! Call me Daddy Helen. That movie is Virtual Weapon from 1997, a movie that I approached with a kind of melancholic blend of joy and sadness. Joy because it's everything I love about movies. Italian lunatics let loose in Miami, making a movie that combines Lethal Weapon, Ghost Dad, and Tron shot on film in the very late for the Italian exploitation film industry. Time of 1997, even better as the high concept of combining Terrence Hill and marvelous Marvin Hagler as buddy cops. Cheer- cheerlessness of this comes from the fact that this is the end. This is the last movie that Antonio Margetti would direct, Anthony M. Dawson for Americans, the last that Br- Bruno Corbucci would write, and the event horizon of an era of films that I love with all my heart. Yet in this small bubble of time, we still get Margetti combining actual car chases with the practical miniature effects that you love in his movies, huge explosions. And yeah, maybe Terrence Hill is thinking about better days alongside Bud Spencer, Marvin Hagler is probably thinking about the time he fought middleweight champ Alan Minter who said, no, black man's going to take my title. Then Hagler hit him so many times so quickly that four gigantic wounds opened on that guy's face. Hagler won the first title in Wembley Arena as fans launched beer bottles his way. But how did he end up in Miami trying to tell jokes and being in his fourth movie for these wacky Italians? Yeah, that's right. Marvin Hagler was also in Indio and Indio 2 for Margetti, as well as A Crossroad Nights for Maurizio Munegula. That I did not pronounce that at all. I just stumbled through it. But anyways. Margetti was probably dreaming of filming cobweb staircases being navigated by a candelabra wielding Barbara Steele, but no matter. Here we are in 1997, Miami, a movie needs made. Terrence Hill is Skims, ex cop turned computer salesman, comes back to Miami to see his old friend Mike Davis, who's Hagler. We all know why he's in town. He's undercover investigating a microchip stealing plot. He's excited to reconnect with a former cop, the widow of his partner, Cello, and bond with her tech loving daughter, Lily. Our heroes finally track down the villain behind all this drama, a man named Abel Von Axel, who goes by the even cooler and if unnecessary name of Mr. X. Sounds like the final boss of a Konami beat-em-up. Despite being informed that Skims is the greatest cop of all time, he gets blown up real good and dies, right? We even see his funeral. I'm shocked they didn't just run the credits. Except that Skims has survived and shows up on Lily's computer, looking like Trinity by way of Auto Man, fighting dinosaurs and transforming like a robot. His power set is beyond crazy, even more so than the goofball abilities Terrence Hill had in Super Fuzz. He can also be invisible unless someone tells him they love him. He can travel through telephone lines and is now a hologram, which is explained as the result of modern technology and biblical faith. This movie is awesome. Of course, the bad guys uh, pay for all this. Skims carries around the bad guy's gun like a ghost turning on him. Everyone's all smiles at the end. Even me, as I watch the credits and try not to think, it's over, it's over, like Roy Orbison. The best thing in this whole movie is that Skims regrets that he's just been killed by techno gangsters and real estate lords and decides to screw around with his fellow cops while they're lifting weights, playing ghost reindeer games with them like he's super fuzz. And I have to tell you, I could watch a 90-minute movie of Terrence Hill screwing around with cops as an invisible ex-cop. You may ask, who else is in this movie? Well, who isn't? This is the last movie of Richard Liberty, who unites the decades of Romero films by playing Artie and the Crazies and Dr. Matt Frankenstein Logan in Day of the Dead. He plays Captain Holmes. The old lady who pulls out a gigantic handgun and fires at criminals is Florence McGee, who is also a senior citizen in Super Fuzz. 
as well as appearing in Empire of the Ants. Tommy Lane is a stuntman who was in Shaft and Ganja and Hest, as long as being a trumpet and flugelhorn player. Wikipedia thinks he's the same Tommy Lane who was in the Rock and Roll RPMs with Mike Davis. He was not. There's also Roger Coward, who's Conan the Librarian from UHF. Eduardo Marghetti, who's obviously the director's son. He would go from doing effects on Your Hunter from the Future to being a second unit director for Hudson Hawk. And a lot of folks who, if you look at their resumes, they were in Florida-based productions like Wild Things and B.L. Stryker. Beyond Corbucci, this was written by Terrence's son, Chess, and executive producer, Ferdy Pacheco. This is the only movie that Ferdy ever wrote or produced because he's better known as being the personal physician and corner man for Muhammad Ali. That's right. He also left Ali's team in 77, when Ali barely won against Ernie Shavers, feeling that the post-physical fight showed that the boxer was falling to pieces. In the book, Muhammad Ali is Life and Times, he said, the New York State Athletic Commission gave me a report that showed that Ali's kidneys were failing, falling apart. I wrote to Angelo Dundee, his trainer, his wife, and Ali himself. I got nothing back in response. That's when I said enough is enough. When they reunited in 2002, when the greatest was suffering Parkinson's, he told the man known as the fight doctor, you was right. This also has one of my favorite things about Italian movies going for it, incredibly wild alternate titles. I get the name Virtual Weapon as it tells you that this is a Mel Gibson, Danny Glover ripoff with a tech twist. And the French title Cyber Flick means Cyber Cop. That makes sense. But in Japan, it's called Point of Dead, which says nothing. Germany got Zue Faste for Miami, Two Fists for Miami. Hungary got the very metal En Vagaka Fegar, which is I Am the Gun, which spoils the ending of the movie. In Italy, it's called Potenza Vitale, which is virtual power. Very metal. I always worry, am I going to run out of these Italian movies I said that I obsess about? So far, I keep finding new things to talk and talk and talk about. On June 16th, we got into some Bruce Ploitation. Unleash to wreak vengeance on the evil ones who brought about his untimely death. Five years ago, Bruce Lee, king of kung fu and undisputed master of the martial arts, was buried, but not before making a deal with the black angel of death. Now... His tormented soul returns as Bruce Lee fights back from the grave. Damn you! every contest the fighters the killers the mobsters the slime of the underworld the bad and the beautiful Bruce Lee fights back from the grave mysteriously through his immortal inner forces Bruce Lee made a spiritual agreement with the invincible and unbeatable Black Angel of Death to free him from the torment and prison of his grave. Can Bruce Lee defeat the invincible and unbeatable, the Black Angel of Death? See if you dare. A supernatural action American movie starring Bruce Lee. The dragon never died. He was just waiting for the moment when he could return from the grave to seek revenge. Warning. Due to the constant action seen in this picture, the producer requests that persons under 17 be accompanied by an adult. Bruce Lee fights back from the grave. Bruce Bloitation's the next film, and that brings us to Bruce Lee fights back from the grave. Originally a South Korean movie entitled Amelika Bangamungageg. Didn't say that right either. Oh, it's called Visitor from America. This was released in the U.S. by Aquarius Releasing with new dubbing. An incredibly awesome poster, Bruce Lee coming out of a grave to defend a half-nude woman to fight a flying baby bat. Baby. It's wild. You just got to see it. 
as well as a new beginning from the U.S. where lightning strikes the grave of Bruce Lee, who soon emerges ready to fight in an amazing display of absolute lunacy. That's it. <laughs> That's all the Bruce Lee we get for the whole movie. Instead, we follow Wong Han, who is Zha Kong, a judo master using the name Bruce K. Lee Lei. He's the founder of the World United Martial Arts Organization and trained Lorenzo Lamas, Sam J. Jones, Philip and Simon Rhee, and Heather Graham. He shows up in L.A. Street Fighters, Silent Assassins, and Street Soldiers. Anyway, Wong Han is making his way to America to learn who killed his brother, Hang Jai Hyuk. Also, it appears Wong's brother died by jumping off his apartment building, is being incinerated in the furnace of the same building, which ends with Wong scooping up all the burned bones and placing them around his neck in a box, along with a photo of the deceased brother, wandering the streets looking for answers. He's then attacked by a man in black, who he defeats and kills, which leads to him being arrested. Wong is bailed out by a rich man named Scott Lee and asked to find Susan played by Deborah Dutch from Deep Jaws and 976 Evil 2, The Astral Factor, who ends up being a waitress. Why Lee hired him as a mystery? Because our hero Shoney has no ability to find the killers of his brother. Anyway, he decides to help Susan instead and teaches her martial arts so quickly that she can fight nearly as well as him in just days. She soon informs a hero that she learned from her job in a Turkish bathhouse. The five men were involved in the death of his brother. The man in black that Wong has already battled, as well as a white man, a Japanese fighter, a Mexican, and a cowboy. There are four million people in Los Angeles. This shouldn't be easy to find them. Then again, he didn't find the killers yet, but did find Susan. So he's batting 500, and in baseball, that gets you in the Hall of Fame. Then, to pad the movie out, our hero goes to a Christmas parade, so people can look directly into the camera, and this can be shot without permits. He won't sleep with Susan for moral reasons, so she buys him his own RV. To sleep in outside her house, how much does working in a Turkish bath pay? I ask you, because I need a better job. Anyways, the cowboy's the last one to live. He kills the other killers before Wong. And that means our hero and he will battle one on one. He fights like a pro wrestler, which I love. We also learn that maybe Wong's brother is still alive, as nearly everyone else dies in this movie. Yes, our hero can't even protect the woman who's helped him so much, choosing to do a fancy flying kick instead of disarming disarming a bad guy. Directed by Lee Du Yong and written by Hong Jaun, this movie is really something else. And it's not good, but yet I loved every minute. I kept thinking about the trailer and the poster and how they've led people to come to the theaters and say, Bruce Lee versus the Black Angel of Death. I mean, I got to see that. And then they don't get any of that. The next movie, uh, two movies for the 17th uh, for my love of Lucio Fulci is How We Robbed the Bank of Italy. I was reading through some letterbox reviews the other day about Lucio Fulci and I saw someone mention that there's humor in one of his movies and that doesn't make sense because Fulci is not known for comedies. Yes, he is. He wrote Toto and the Moon and he directed The Thieves, Leto at Tre Piazze, The Swindlers, I'm Meniaki, I Do Avaste de Sing Sing, Oh Those Most Secret Agents, I Pericoli Poblucia, How We Got in Trouble with the Army, 002 Operation Luna, The Two Parachutists, How We Saw the Atomic Bomb. Operation St. Peter's, The Eroticist, Dracula and the Providences, My Sister-in-Law, and The Long, The Short, The Cat, and this movie. So 57 movies that Fulci directed, 16 are comedies. So yeah, he did do comedies. Uh, like many of those 16 comedies, 13 of them uh, star Franco Franchi and Sissio Ingrassia. As always, they play two Sicilian morons. Franco is completely deranged and uses his body in wild facial motions to try and communicate in the loudest ways possible. Why Sushio is the mass that mustache wearing bully who thinks he's the smart of the two, but he's probably the dumber. They neither is smart. In this movie, they also have an older brother who is amazing. He's called the master. He's an incredible thief. He's Paolo. He wants his brothers to stop being criminals so they don't leave the police to him. So he sets them up all the time with money, homes, and girlfriends. They're so annoying that they can't keep any of these things and they want to be criminals like their brother. Paolo meets two women who seem perfect for his brothers, Marilina and Rosalina, who are gorgeous, but just as dumb. He sets them all up in a villa, leaves the country to hire experts to pull off the most daring and final heist, which is robbing the Bank of Italy, except that the girls are gangsters too. And one, our heroes, to show just how good they are being crooks and pull off their brother's plan before he gets back. This is a heist film that is a comedic ripoff of Seven Golden Men that even finds Franco and Chichio dressing up as Diabolic from the comics to rob a safe. Plus, you get appearances by Sylvia Steubing from Strip Nude for Your Killer, Kitty Swan from House of a Thousand Dolls, Maria Luisa Rispoli from Criminal, another comic book tie-in, and Adriana Ambassi from Fangs of the Living Dead. 
Fulci wrote this with Roberto Giovate, who wrote 134 movies, including the Fulci movies, Don't Torture a Duckling, Murder Rock, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, and The Psychic. And Amadeo Salazzo, who wrote my favorite Italian Western title, God Was in the West Too, at one time. And the story is by Alfonso Brescia, who would use the name Al Bradley to make the music video like a tour sequel, Italian Warrior, as well as directing The Beast in Space, an entire galaxy full of Italian soap operas. I have to confess to you that I originally hated the movies of Franchi and Gracia when I first watched them. Now I find them charming. Maybe in the previously mentioned Argento series, there's a sequence where he talks about them in an interview and how you have to appreciate their humor. But, uh, you know, I really like this one. There's some Space Age sets and some awesome opening Super Thief action. Uh, it's really fun. The second Fulci movie I hit, uh, again, to prove that Fulci is not the godfather of gore, is Howlers of the Dock, a.k.a. Urlatore alla Sbarra. When folks online cover Italian exploitation genre, often the concentration is horror, cannibal music, mondo, western, giallo. Anything but the Musgarello, which are jukebox musicals inspired by Elvis's films Jailhouse Rock and Love Me Tender, the film that really broke the Spalloni, which is a small stream, so to speak, that flows from the larger river of Italian cinema, was Go Johnny Go, directed by Paul Andres and starred Jimmy Clanton, Chuck Berry, Richie Valens, and Eddie Cochran. It was released in Italy as Vi Johnny Vi, and had sequence filmed just for the Italian market, with singer Adriano Shalantano opening and closing the film. In the pre MTV world, well, MTV doesn't play videos anymore, but just go with me for a second. Music Rello featured younger singers in the main roles like Johnny Maradi, Albano, Mal Ryder, Tony Rennes, Adriano Salentano, who was mentioned before, Bobby Solo, Oriette Berte, Little Tony, and more. And they would perform songs from their latest albums, like music videos. As one would expect, several of the same directors who excelled in other Italian felonies made their own music movies, including Bruno Corbucci, Fernando Baldi. Ruggiero Diodato, Duccio Tosari, who was one of the many founders of Italian Westerns as well, and the unholy team of Antonio Marghetti and Renato Pacelli. Yet the originator of native Italian-made musicarello is Lucio Fulci. He made Ragazze del Jukebox first, and then the second example of this, this genre, which is Howlers of the Dock. Wikipedia explains the musicarello is a mix between uh, photo com comics or fumetti, which is photo mazari, Traditional comedy hit songs and tender references to the tensions between generations. Of course, these tensions are between or before the days of lead and the radicalized political movements that would make up most of the late 60s and 70s in Italy. As this genre gets a bit older, generational revolt moves to the backside as studios don't want to touch it. Also, the music in the genre no longer is directed toward old people, so think of how the AIP Beach movies seem so dated in just the few years they were released compared to Easy Rider. A company that makes blue jeans has to rethink their image because a group called the Teddy Boys, young men and women who love American rock and roll, are wearing their clothes. The leaders of this group are Joe Il Rosso, who is Joe Santeri, whose biggest song was Uno de Tanti, which was translated by Lieber and Stoller and recorded by a lot of American artists as I Who Have Nothing. He's also in The Most Beautiful Way for Nelly Muti. Mina, who is Mina, Italy's best-selling music artist of all time. Known as the Queen of Screamers and the Tigress of Cremonia. She was banned from TV and radio soon after this movie due to her relationship with married actor Corrado Pani and her out of wedlock pregnancy. She was so famous and beloved that this ban ended in less than a year, despite her songs being about her problems with religion, her love of sex, and her love of her most favorite thing, cigarettes. Her look was so alien to Italian audiences, shave eyebrows, dyed blonde hair, and fragrant sex appeal. Uh, and it makes her look as cool in 2024 as she did in 1960. And there's also Adriano, is Adriano Celitano, who introduced rock and roll to Italy with several songs. He's also uh, in Fulci's first musicrella. His daughter, Rosalinda, ended up playing Satan in The Passion of the Christ. Passion of the Christ! Get me down off for this cross. Anyway, that blue jean company wants the kids to improve their image and do good deeds, yet they remain suspicious of them. While this is happening, Joe falls in love with Julia, who is uh, L.K. Summer. And can you blame him? It's L.K. Summer, whose father, Gio Morelli, runs the TV network and is a politician who wants these rockers off TV and to stop influencing young folks. There are 20 songs in this movie, and you may look through the list of them and say, Chet Baker doing a Riva Yes, Chet Baker, the Prince of Cool, is in this movie. 
He was seen by Hollywood as a potential movie star, but the promise of his early career was marred by a life filled with drug addiction. This comes up in the movie as he's often sleeping. Yes, he was really nodding off. And it's turned to a comedic plot point. He's sleeping because he's on drugs. This is also the first appearance of Marilia Tulo, who is the only woman that Valentino ever loved. Uh, she's also one of my all-time favorite Italian westerns, Django Kill, If You Live, Shoot. Who she wrote this was Giovanni Adesi, who wrote and produced Web of the Spider, and Vittorio Vigi, who did I, Maniaki. Yet his closest collaborator is Piero Vivaldi, who was listed as screenwriter and assistant director. According to the website Italo Cinema, uh, Vivaldi had been working for radio stations since the 50s and from the 60s onward was editor of the music magazine Big. He always wrote the editorials himself and was regularly devoured by young folks looking for good music. His opinion carried weight. Whoever he thought was good could become famous. Whoever he ignored was ignored by the audience. Vivaldi lived a wild life. In addition to his music influence, he directed Avenger X and Satanic, wrote Django, and later his career wrote the story for Joe D'Amato's Emmanuel in Bangkok and Emmanuel in America. Besides that, he was the only foreigner other than Che Guevara to have his membership card for the Cuban Communist Party signed Fidel Castro. Working together with cinematographer Gianni DeVinazzo, who would go on to shoot Eight and a Half, The Tenth Victim, and Julia the Spirits before dying way too young, Felici and Vivaldi created a new visual template for how young folks would see music that would soon be adapted by Scopatones and music videos. Not to be a broken record, but Fulci remains, as ever, so much more than just his horror movies. June 18th brought us Gangsters and Undana Per Seven Bastardi, A Woman for Seven Bastards is next, and it stars Gordon Mitchell as Gordon and Antonio Cezal as Carl. They've taken gold, moved to the middle of nowhere in Italy, and hide their fortune in wooden shacks. No one bothers them because they also have a stranglehold on this small town's alcohol sales, marking it up and getting everyone wasted. However, a crippled man, Richard Harrison, who came up with this movie's idea, has come to town and everyone's about to get exposed. Every single person in this small mining town is horrible. I mean it. There are murderers, child molesters, thieves. In the middle of them all, playing them off one another, is the gorgeous and insatiable Rita, played by Dagmar Lassender. She loves every minute of destroying everyone in this town, which could be a spaghetti western town for all we know. It's shot on one of the sets. This would feel like a western, save for the modern truck, the clothing, and the bottles and bottles of J&B. There is so much J&B here that you might think that you're at a Jalo convention. Also, Miss Lassender uses a broken bottle of J&B to protect herself. It is great. But everything in this movie it feels filthy. Everyone feels like they're waiting to die or kill you. And it's a lot like a bad day at Black Rock mixed with the Italian West ability to keep remaking a Jimbo and then ripping off ripoffs until you accept and love it because, hey, it's Italy. It's directed by Roberto Bianche Montero, who made The Slashers, The Sex Maniac. Written by Harrison and Lele Bongiorno, who wrote The House by the Edge of the Lake. And shot by Mario Mancini, who made uh, was the cameraman for Nightmare Castle, Blood and Black Lace, and uh, several other films before directing his only movie, Frankenstein 80, that's going to 100% be on the show. This is a movie that surprised me and kept me enraptured throughout. Then again, I do love people using Old West sets for modern or post-apocalyptic reasons, also known as the Sewer Rats. The second gangster movie I did is Weapons of Death, Neale Spara. Uh, it comes from the Commissioner Betty series. The three other movies are Violent Rome, Violent Naples, and Special Cop in Action. It's a spinoff mostly featuring Genario, who is Masamo Detti. Betty's also in this, but instead of Leonard Mann... You're getting Leonard Man now, I mean, instead of Mario's and Matt Marley, it's a, it's a downgrade. Also, uh, instead of Umberto Lenzi, we have Mario Keanu, who directed Nightmare Castle. The villain is the main reason to watch us. It's Henry Silva, who is always awesome. He's a hitman named Santoro, who is protected by Don Alfredo, an older crime boss. He's able to train so many new criminals that he doesn't just put Belly's job in jeopardy, but his reputation. Because the one time that Santoro gets a gun on him, he lets the cop live, telling him, you go your way and I'll go mine. That's how smart he is. As instead of killing Betty, everyone thinks that Betty has something to do with him and is paid off by him. So it ruins his rep. At the same time, the other crime families all begin to hint Santoro for how out of control he is. One of his major crimes has mass people running wild in the streets, shooting people, kicking women in the stomach. Then they try to rub him out. What's amazing is about that in the street, scene is a lot of this movie like all italian movies was made without permits closing streets 
or even informing crowds of people that they were in the middle of a movie. So you can only imagine this is shot during near the end of the days of lead. This looks like a real robbery, a real crime is happening. They put the camera inside a box on a truck. Italy, you are amazing. This lives up to its uh, plesiotech of madness because kids are turned into young gangster. A motorcycle rider gets beheaded and a pedophile is castrated in prison. Also, Edie Agali is in it or Evelyn Stewart, whatever name you prefer. Wow, weapons of death. On the uh, next day, which was the 19th, the Maestro uh, del Terror, which is a Lombardo Baba TV movie, is my 80s horror pick. I've done a really 80, 180 on Lombardo. Maybe it's the first movie I watched of his was Devilfish. And then I saw Demons, and I said, well, maybe he did Demons because Argento is with him. But I should have started with Macabre, A Blade in the Dark, and a lot of his TV movies, and I feel different. Maybe I unfairly compared him with his dad and said of Long Island to be judged on his own merit. merit. So I am sorry, John Old Jr. This film, The Prince of Terrors, never been released in the U.S. on VHS, DVD, or Blu-ray. You know, uh, labels keep putting out all these, you know, packages of movies that we've seen a million times in different formats. I'd love to get more Italian TV released. I'd like to get more American made on TV released. This movie pulls off the body double trick as soon as it starts. As you get the jump scare of Magda escaping an RV only to see her boyfriend drown in a swamp and then becoming an inflated zombie. That isn't happening. We're really on the set of Vincent Oman's latest movie. He's played by Thomas Arana from The Church. He hates the script from longtime co-writer Paul Hillary. David Brandon, who was the director in Stage Fright, the director so dumb he let us cast in a theater where the killing machine whose life they were ripping off was hiding. Anyway, Vincent fires Paul and then heads out to play golf. He's interviewed by Virginia Bryant, who was Canary in The Barbarians, another movie that will totally be on this, who asks him about the rumors that he's much older than 37 and his public perception as being the devil. He holds up a golf ball, which has 666 on it. Yeah, he's into it. After he finishes playing, he goes home to his wife, Betty, Carol Andre from Your Hunter from the Future, and his daughter, Susan, and their little dog, Demon. That evening, he and his lovely spouse join his producer and Magda for dinner, but then golf balls explode in their home. They start getting prank phone calls. And their phone lines are severed. Demon the dog is killed by having his fur removed and he's just thrown in the garbage. Because this is an Italian movie, don't get too close to dogs or children. A bald killer with a huge knife soon appears. And by the end of the movie, Omen's been shot. His wife steps in a bear trap. His daughter gets buried alive in the basement. The toilet flushes blood and the script for a movie comes out of it. And the security guards have been replaced by robots. It's an all over the place plan that somehow was put together in days by Paul, the writer and actor, Eddie Fielson, who is that bald monster outside who both want to get back at Vincent. The good thing about this movie, uh, Sergio Stavaldi, who did the wax mask, gets a workout here is when Vincent finally gets his revenge. He attacks people with his six, six, six golf balls, including one that blows a man's wrist up and another that goes full on Fulci and blows up someone's eye. Plus we get a Simon Boswell score. I wonder how much of this story was writer Dardana Sakati getting his scripting revenge on former friend and co-creator Lucio Fulci, the scene where he's accused of stealing ideas and it becomes obvious that Omen has no ideas of his own, as well as that bloody script coming out of a toilet seemed to feel that way. It's fun in an Italian TV movie that way. I love Italian TV movies, but if you aren't into them, you may seem think they're slow and cheesy. I think they're great. This is part of a series of movies that aired on Italian TV is Alta Tensione. The other examples are L'Uomo Che Non Vale More, in which a man is near death in a hospital and tries to remember what, how he got there. Uh, Il Giacco, which is School of Fear, the story of a teacher thinking her students murdered the instructor before her. And Testimote Accalte, which is Eyewitness, uh, which is a straight-up giallo, all directed by Lamberto Balva. Uh, again, more American boutique labels need to release these. Hail to Cauldron Films for putting out the House of series. Uh, instead of just releasing, this, releasing the same movies again and again, there's so much out there, and I, and I implore you to check out this film. This is the color of black, baby. It's a whole lot different than white. Come on, nigga! Come on, nigga! I'm a devil! He's the goddamn devil, man. Order. What kind of giant oh. is man? You let that devil sit on all of them goddamn lives on you. You let this devil and tell all them goddamn lives, man. Oh, go to hell, you stupid
Hey, baby. Ten and three? Oh, man. Why you gotta put me through all this? You know the going rate is 20 and three. Okay, 20 and three. Welcome home, Brother Charles. You done the man's time. Now you're gonna do ours. Hey, baby, what's happening? Hey, man, you telling me to wait, man, let the biggest dope push in all of Sunday Sutton, California out on the streets again? Hey, baby, damn! And I'll take it off. Oh, baby, that's a deal. Dirty, slimy bastard! That's why I meet a man the first chance I get. Welcome home, Brother Charles. A motion picture about the way it is and the way some people think it should be. That kind of hatred brings on mania. Look, I didn't come here to be called a maniac, Doctor. Now, a man damn near cuts my manhood off. Now, what am I supposed to do? Nothing? Tell him to come downstairs. Come down for a moment, dear, please. What's the butter, honey? Yeah. <laughs> They tried to take everything, even his manhood. The last movie in uh, the second episode about dream exploitation is from June 20th, which is Black Exploitation Day. And that movie would be Welcome Home, Brother Charles from 1975. It's directed by James Fanica, who was born William Gordon, or sorry, Walter Gordon. Uh, he's one of the leading directors of the Ellie Rebellion Film Movement, which is a new generation of young African and African-American filmmakers who studied at UCLA Film School from the late 60s to the late 80s. They created a new form of cinema that was an alternative to Hollywood, but Fanica was very much fascinated by Hollywood and adverse to the contentious ideological and artistic discussions that were fundamental to the formation of this school. He independently produced, wrote, directed, and edited uh, this movie. It's an undergraduate project. It took 17 months a weekend, all of his savings, and some of his parents as well. Fanica's advisors at the school told him not to even try a feature film as his class project. He ended up creating one that won a national theater distribution deal with Crown International Pictures. The director would complete his thesis film MMA and penitentiary while still in college. Sure, it was released on video as Soul Vengeance, but this movie isn't your typical black exploitation film. Despite beginning with his hero Charles being arrested by corrupt white police and nearly castrated, when he's released, all he wants to do is forget the past. He wants to move past the life of crime he once led. He can't even have Twyla, the girl he loves, who is now the woman of his former best friend and now enemy N.D. Sure, okay, it sounds like a typical black exploitation movie up till now, and I promise you it wasn't. And that's because, spoiler, if you're going to watch this movie, you might not want to know this, but when Charles was in prison, he was experimented on, kind of like Luke Cage in Marvel Comics, but instead of getting skin that knives and bullets can't touch, 
you get to murderous and prehensile penis. Seriously, it's feet, not inches long. It looks like a giant snake. It's the kind of penis that obviously frightens the white male establishment way more than a typical black member. But perhaps when he's not using it, perhaps because he's using it to seduce the white wives of the cop who tried to slice off his penis, Officer Harry Freeman, as well as the prosecutor and judges set him up. He's also strangling those men with it, which has to be the worst way for white straight men to die. Despite trying to find some form of comfort with a, a prostitute named Carmen, prison has destroyed Charles. And what he's done to Freeman's wife has ruined that cop as if he needed any help, telling his wife that she's contaminated. That's because even before he gained that monstrous member, Charles was cucking that cop. And that's why Freeman tried to take a knife to our hero while he was in handcuffs. I have no idea why this cop stayed married, as one evening he wakes her up by choking his wife into oblivion. She looks in the eye and snarls, you think you're a man? You don't even have the guts to destroy your object of humiliation. Me. Also, maybe I didn't mention it, but Charles's new penis... Who would do this experiment? I mean, what was it for? Who authorized it? Like, what is the end result of this? Uh, this new penis can hypnotize white women. I love that Welcome Home Brother Charles exists, that it has sl sloppy moments where we just watch people dancing in the streets and footage ahead of just be the camera running and capturing what these small Los Angeles neighborhoods used to be like. And as wild as this movie gets, it only hints at how far Fanica would push reality with the penitentiary series. Anyways, we got 10 more movies left in June exploitation. I hope that you'll come back and hear the next episode as well as there's another episode coming up soon too. Uh, you can reach out to me at B and S about movies at gmail.com. You can come to the website at BNS about movies.com. There's a Kofi link there. If you'd like to donate to the show, please oh gosh, all the cheesy stuff you have to say on podcast, you know, rate us a five, tell your friends like this, subscribe. I mean, all these things do help. I have 19 people subscribed now and it's like, oh, it's, it seems like a lot of work for 19 people. So maybe you'll be 20. Anyways, this is probably the longest episode we've done. Thanks for sticking with it. If you're here this far, talk to you soon.